Okay, so the last lecture, part one, we talked about just generic periodicity and electron configuration. Now we're going to kind of back up a smidge so that we can get into the electron configuration of ions and then talk about more, we talk more about periodic trends and also some of the exceptions to the electron configuration rule. So we're going to start with Coulomb's law. Um, I'm not really going to require you to do a whole lot of stuff with this, um, this equation here, but you generically need to understand it um, conceptually and literally be able to plug and chug as you, as you go through. You might see one question of this on your exam. So Coulomb's law just tells us about how charged particles are attracted and repulsed. Now I know generically you know this. I know that you guys know in a magnet, for example, opposite ends of a magnet attract, right? Um, that is true. When we have positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons, then what we have are attractions. But then also the negatively charged electrons that are surrounding this grouping of positively charged protons, those electrons are repelling each other while also being attracted to the positive protons. Okay? So, um, this is why, for example, when we say there's a pair of electrons, we said, for example, S could hold two electrons. So, in its electron configuration, we, we denoted it with a half arrow representing one electron facing up, the other electron half arrow facing down. They have opposite spins because they are the same charge. They're both negatively charged. So like charges are going to repel each other. Opposite charges are going to attract each other. I, that's just kind of common sense. So Coulomb's law states that the overall potential energy um, is positive and it decreases as the particles get further apart, okay? Or as R increases, remember R is radius. And if you recall, we're just gonna talk about um, the S orbital, which is spherical. If that's my nucleus, if that's my nucleus, then the radius is from the center to the edge and the diameter is completely left to right, all right? So it should make sense that if they're getting farther apart, the potential energy is going to decrease. Opposite charges, the potential energy is negative and becomes more negative as they get closer together. Again, think of two magnets. If you have opposite ends, the closer and closer and closer you push them together, they're eventually going to you know, connect. But if you flip one of those magnets over, the closer and closer and closer you get, the more you can feel that repulsion of the, the same charge, okay? The strength of the interaction increases as the size of the charge increases. So what do we really mean by this? The long and short and the takeaway is this right here. Electrons are more strongly attracted to a nucleus with a two plus charge than a nucleus with a one plus charge. So what do we mean by that? So if I have a nucleus that has two positively charged protons, okay, the electron surrounding it is going to be more strongly attracted to those two positive charges as opposed to if I have just one positively charged proton and one electron, that's actually going to kind of negate itself and be neutral. So when we have multi-electron atoms, every single atom is, every single electron is going to experience a different pull from the nucleus. And what we mean by that is, because of where the electrons surrounding the nucleus are, are exist, where the, in what orbital they are, um, some blocking may occur, some attraction may occur. When there's blocking, we refer to it literally as shielding. Okay? When an electron is shielded from a nucleus, 
that means there's other electrons in the way. You have the positively charged nucleus that has the positive protons in it, and then electrons surrounding it. So if I have an outer electron and there's other electrons in the way, not only are they going to block that negative attraction towards the positive, but also it's going to increase the negative negative repulsion. We call the net of this the effective nuclear charge or the Z effect. So let's look at this and what it really looks like. We know about SP, G, and F at this point. Um, S orbitals are better shielders than P orbitals and so on and so forth. So these are the best shielders and these are the worst shielders. Okay, so if we look at this example here, as opposed to this example, <clears throat> we have a nucleus in this particular case. There are three positively charged protons in this nucleus. All right. And we have one, two, three electrons surrounding this nucleus. And what happens is you have a net charge here of about plus one for this particular electron. Why? Well, penetration. How far in can it get? How close to that nucleus can it get? This electron right here, eh, not so much shielded. But if I had another electron here and maybe another one here, these two electrons are shielding this electron from being attracted to that, the protons in that nucleus. So let's go back to <clears throat> our, our trick and let's again compare. Remember that if you recall, this is S, P, D, and F sections. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three, four, five, six, four, five. We're just going to recall that. So if we go back and look at oxygen, we're going to say, okay, oxygen, we said, had an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. All right. Now, <clears throat> if we were to draw out oxygen, here's the nucleus. In my 1s2, I'm going to have two electrons. Okay. I don't know what just happened. Sorry, guys. Two electrons. Those are those right there. Then I got 2s2. and 2p4. I'm, I'm not going to draw these as a figure eight for purposes of simplicity. I'm just going to draw a sphere um, because it will just get too convoluted. Okay. Now, actually, <clears throat> hang on, I want to change the colors on this. The reason I color coded these is because we're going to talk about two things right now. We're going to talk about core electrons and valence electrons and then charges. So our core electrons are anything that is not a valence electron. Well, Miss Merriweather, what is a valence electron? A valence electron are the electrons that exist in the outermost sublevel. 
and main energy level. Okay, so if I consider the electron configuration, the second main energy level is the outermost in this particular case. So the outermost, these are our valence electrons. Valence electrons are responsible for bonding. All right, the core electrons are anything that is not a valence electron. Therefore, the blue ones. They're the innermost electrons. All right, so why does this matter? The reason it matters is because of the octet rule. And the octet rule states that elements will react and behave and form compounds because they want eight valence electrons. That is the goal. The goal is eight valence electrons. This is why elements become charged. The whole element will become charged. We're no longer just talking about the positively charged protons and the negatively charged electrons. We're talking about the whole entire element. It will gain or lose electrons depending on how many valence it has. So right now, oxygen has a total of one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. It wants two more to make that eight. So what will happen is it will bond to gain those two extra electrons. Now, before it gained those two extra electrons, we know that there was a total of eight protons in the nucleus and one, two, three, four, five, five, six, seven, eight electrons. Neutral oxygen has eight protons and eight electrons. Positive eight plus negative eight is a net of zero. It's neutral, it's not charged. However, as soon as I gain, you know, I'm always doing stuff I didn't want to. Okay, let me just redraw this. I just gotta draw it all over. Oh boy. Nucleus. As soon as I gain two extra electrons, now I have 10 electrons and still eight protons. So negative 10 plus eight is an overall charge of two minus. So what that means is the electron configuration now for O, two minus is one S two, two S two, two P six. Okay. 
if I were talking about the magnesium that we did, okay, talk about magnesium, we originally said it was 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. So its outermost valence electrons are these 3s2 right here. But if you count, you'll see there's eight electrons there. When magnesium becomes an ion, it is much more energetically favorable that these two go away, leaving two more protons than electrons, than trying to gain six more electrons to make three um, P6. So magnesium's ion electron configuration is this. Okay, the outermost valence electrons are the ones responsible for bonding and they will either, elements will either gain or lose electrons depending on what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to get to a summary of how you can predict the charges of the representative um, elements and then we're going to talk a little bit about the transitionals and I'm going to give you a couple of those um, but in general that's the trend uh, there's a couple other trends I just want to talk about where um, I'm just going to introduce but we'll talk about them in more depth later so we already talked about as you go up into the right on the periodic table decreasing metallic character Decreasing atomic radii. Just kind of write these down. Uh, we'll talk about more of these in depth in a few minutes. Um, increasing electronegativity. Um, decreasing electron affinity. And I know I'm forgetting one. What am I forgetting? Oh, effective nuclear charge. So as you go down and across, you are um, increasing the effective nuclear charge or the Z effect. Okay, just kind of keep those on the back burner. With electron configuration, the last thing I want to talk about are the exceptions. So the D9s, remember this is the D section. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the D9s and the D4s, normally we'd say if we were looking at copper. One, two. Two P six. Sorry, my camera's in the way. I don't even know where I wrote that. My camera's totally in the way of where I'm writing. Sorry, guys. 3P6, 4S2. If we're doing copper, we say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 3D9. Normally, that's what we would say, correct? Just based on our little trick on the periodic table. Well, the D9s and the D4s are an exception. 
And the reason they are an exception is because it is more stable to have a full or half filled D sublevel and borrow from the S than it is to have an unfilled D simply because it's a higher energy level. So the electron configuration for copper is actually 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1, 3d10. Okay? All right. Now let's also talk about this in terms of core notation. Core notation is a shorthand way of writing electron configuration. Basically because when we get down into the, into the transitional metals, this is a ton to write. I mean, if, you, if I'm talking about like say for example, uh, gold, right? That's tons of stuff to write. So what we can do is we can go back to the previous noble gas and say such and such as electron configuration is everything up to and including the noble gas plus blah blah blah. So I just wrote it for copper. Its closest noble gas previous to it, it must be previous, is argon. So I can say copper's electron configuration is argon, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. That matches this, 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 and this. So I can say copper is everything up to and including argon plus this. This is core notation. Okay, you will need to know how to write both core notation and also the long way. But if it's a long way one, I won't have you do it with something that's super huge. So maybe, you know, something that's way more simple, okay? All right. <coughs> I highly suggest going through these examples um, in the PowerPoints. Now these are the exceptions. The ones you're going to be responsible for knowing are chromium and this is the exception for the same reason copper is. You need to know copper and you need to know palladium. Now we've already talked about this where our metals are non-metals and semi-metals or metalloids are. Again, here's your stair step, your metals, your nons, Now, metals always form cations. Cations are positively charged atoms. We just saw why magnesium ion becomes an ion, why it's positively charged. Because I started off with 12 positively charged protons and 12 negatively charged electrons, which made it overall neutral. But as soon as it lost two of those electrons to make it 10 electrons, the overall net is plus two. Plus 12 minus 10, that's a plus two overall. So your charge is either positive or negative. <coughs> Excuse me. And the number is associated with the number of electrons that were lost or gained. So metals always and forever form cations which are positively charged. Non-metals always form negatively charged atoms, always negative because they're gaining. They want to get to that eight, that those eight valence electrons. So your good rule of thumb is all of group one, 
will be plus one when it becomes an ion. All of group two will be plus two. Group 13, I don't like when they use 1A and 3A and 4A, I don't like any of that. Um, I like to use just the numbers straight across, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way to 18, okay? So when I ask you about, you know, groups, we're going to be talking about 1 through 18, not with the letters and single numbers. So all of group 13, metals, will be 3 plus 3. Now group 14 can be plus four or minus four, it depends for the non-metal, but for the metals, it's going to be uh, mostly plus four, but it can also be plus two. So if you look at tin and lead, tin is here, lead is here, they will either be plus four or plus two. Most commonly, you'll see a plus two. Now we're gonna go over to the, how, now what, well, let's, let's start with the noble gases. The noble gases are neutral. Okay, so really no charge. It's very, very difficult for the um, noble gases to react. We can do it, but it's extremely unstable. It exceeds the octet rule. We can do it, that's why we had to change their name from the inert gases to the noble gases because we found they were no longer inert. Um, but for all intents and purposes here, we're gonna say they have an octet and they're good. So group 17 minus one, group 18 or 16 minus two, and group 15 minus three, all of them, okay? Now, for the transitional metals, I'm just gonna give you the most common ones that you should know. Um, the most common ones that you should know, you do not have to memorize this. I will either tell you what the charge is, or I will give you enough information to figure it out. So we're just going to kind of fill in what these elements are. So we got, um, let's see here, we got S, E, N, All right, <clears throat> so for those elements, um, the most common charges, for, I'm only giving you some of them. Copper, you're gonna see plus one or plus two. Zinc, you're gonna see plus two or plus four. Nickel, plus one or plus two. Cobalt, could be anything. Plus two is the most common, so is plus three. Same with iron. Manganese can be anything, plus two, plus four, plus seven, can be anything. Um, most common for chromium, you're gonna see plus two and plus four. Vanadium, most common is gonna be plus two and plus five, okay? Um, for silver, oh, let's do silver. Silver's down here. Most common is gonna be plus one. Mercury, right? plus one or plus two okay so those you got to know they're the most common but I will never expect you to know which one is just going to magically be as part of the product okay I will either tell you or give you enough information okay so to solve for effective nuclear charge which is the basis for why a lot of these um, elements to react react the way they do is simply by saying this equation right here so basically it says z and s <coughs> excuse me s is in the lower energy levels basically s um, are your core electrons all right um, I'm sorry, I just totally messed that up. They, they are your core electrons. And Z is your positively charged protons. Okay, so in this particular example, you have three protons, 
two core electrons and we know they're the core electrons because they're telling you in this particular example where everything is located. Remember, the valence electrons are your outermost electrons, furthest away from the nucleus. So not just the sublevels, but the whole main energy level. In this particular case, there's only one valence electron and it's in the 2s sublevel. So here is your one valence, but there's two core. So this valence electron has an effective nuclear charge of plus one. So valence electrons in magnesium, two. Valence electrons in aluminum, three. Valence electrons in sulfur, six. How do I know this? The electron configuration. Magnesium's electron configuration its outermost electrons are these right there. This would leave behind an octet. Aluminum. The whole main energy level. Two plus one is three, so that's three valence electrons. Okay, this would leave behind its next lowest orbital as a full octet. Okay, remember we talked about those trends that I told you just to write down, keep on the back burner. We're gonna define all those. Um, ionization energy is the energy needed to take an electron from something else, okay? This is an endothermic process. Endothermic means heat in. We gotta put heat in to the system, okay? Um, if it's ionization energy, it's taking an electron. I'm not gonna have you guys worry about first, second, and third ionization energies. Just know by definition, the first ionization energy is typically the weakest energy needed, or let me rephrase that, the least amount of energy needed. It's as you get further and further and further closer to the nucleus that it requires much more energy to remove those electrons. Electron affinity, that's the ability or the energy needed to keep an electron. Okay, and this is exothermic. When it keeps that electron or gains an electron, it's a release of energy or, ener or heat or energy out. Now, I'm going to interchange the words heat and energy. In this course, they mean the same thing. And when we get into thermodynamics, I'll explain more about that. So your description of metals and non-metals right here, um, basically metals are malleable, meaning they're bendable. In fact, if I had pure gold, I could use my fingernail to carve letters into it. That's how uh, bendable and, and you know shapeable it is. They are very ductile. Um, they're shiny, pretty. I mean, we all know we use metals for jewelry, right? They do conduct heat and electricity. Um, most oxides are basic, so that means some metal bonded to some oxygen, most of them will be basic as opposed to acidic. All metals form cations, and by way of forming cations or being positively charged, it is because they lose electrons, which we call being oxidized. A loss of electrons leads to a positive charge, and that loss of electrons means it is oxidized. Nonmetals, completely the opposite. They are brittle in their solid state. They're dull, they're not pretty, they're not reflective. Um, they do not conduct electricity. 
um, and they form anions and polyatomic anions, meaning poly meaning many. Um, so an anion might be O2 minus or F minus, where a polyatomic could be something like CO3 2 minus or PO4 3 minus. Um, you do need to start now with flashcards and memorizing your polyatomic anions. There's a list up for you under helpful information. I, it's either helpful information or the practice worksheets. I can't remember, um, but they're in one of those. And because they form anions or are negatively charged, that means they have gained electrons, they've gained negativeness, and therefore we call it reduced. We talked about all these trends. I'm not going to go over them again, but these are in the uploaded PowerPoints for review for you to reference later. And here is just your summary table. This is a pretty decent summary table. I suggest printing this out and just having it handy. Or you can just write on your periodic table, like the up and to the right, and, and what, you know, what, what the trends are. Of course, there are exceptions to every single one of those trends, but just know that overall it's a good rule of thumb. Okay? All right. See you on the flip side.